So welcome everyone to this panel on case law and evidence. I'm really excited to be chairing this today. And we've got a really nice set of uh, papers. However, unfortunately, one of our papers uh, did withdraw. So that's Mayan class, who unfortunately is not well enough to uh, present her paper. But we still have these three very nice looking papers. And uh, let's uh, get started with the first one. So Dr. Gamze Ovaki is a research assistant in the final year of her PhD at Bill Kent University Faculty of Law in Turkey, working on an empirical and critical analysis of asylum case law in Turkey, and was a visiting researcher of Radboud University Center for Migration Law in 2019-20. She was part of the policy development unit of UNHCR Turkey between 2017 and 18, working with asylum lawyers and judges. And she was previously part of the project development and implementation unit of IOM Turkey between 2012 and 2014, and also worked with the International Center for Migration Policy Development Turkey as a freelance expert on migration and asylum law between 2016 and 2017. Gamza, it's great to have you here with all your expertise and the title of your uh, presentation, Analysis of Problematic Legal Issues in Turkish Case Law on Asylum. Over to you, Gamze. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, hello, all. Uh, it's very nice uh, meeting with all of you this morning. Um, I will, like Nick said, I'll talk about the uh, asylum case law in Turkey, but um, I hope that this will not be a, uh, only a, a reflection of uh, Turkish law, but uh, maybe you will be able to find similar uh, instances of discrepancies uh, from your own uh, jurisdictions uh, parallel to what I will uh, talk about. Uh, so I hope it will be interesting for all of you. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, I, let me uh, tell you my, about my uh, plan what I will follow. I'll just uh, briefly mention uh, the context and methodology uh, first, and then uh, we will talk about the problematic issues in Turkish uh, case law. And under that, there will be three, pro three problematic uh, issues that I have identified. Um, first of all, uh, uh, about the context, I mean, why? Uh, do Turkish court decisions uh, even matter um, in this uh, context? Um, first, uh, well, Turkey, as uh, you might be familiar, it is a, perceived as a safe third country for EU states, uh, meaning that um, uh, with, the, with the arrangement of the uh, readmission agreement, EU-Turkey readmission agreement, um, the irregular migrants who pass uh, through Turkey and cross to EU countries uh, are eligible to be sent back uh, to Turkey uh, by the EU by those EU countries. Uh, so there is there is a good chance uh, that a person, uh, an irregular migrant who might be an asylum seeker, also actually, uh, could be uh, sent back to Turkey from uh, Europe if he or she passed through Turkey before. Uh, so it is important in terms of the non recommon obligation of uh, EU states because uh, in order for the, this arrangement, the safe third country arrangement to work, uh, the, um, uh, the situation in Turkey should be somewhat safe uh, so that the, the EU, Turkey, EU, EU states will not be uh, violating their non recommon obligations. So this is one aspect why Turkish court decisions uh, matter, uh, because if the, 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 the court uh, system is not functioning well in Turkey, or if from the court decisions we do not see a well-functioning asylum system in Turkey, then it might be a prob uh, problematic matter in that sense. Also, Turkey is the top refugee hosting country in the world. Uh, there are 3.8 million refugees in Turkey, and um, the the issue is uh, the, the standard, the protection standard in Turkey 
uh, is important for uh, in, in terms of their protection needs. Uh, so that's the second uh, reason why. And why I wanted to uh, focus on judicial appeal mechanisms uh, instead of, let's say, as, uh, administrative procedures, for instance. Uh, well, because the judicial uh, mechanisms are the ultimate safeguards for uh, individual rights violations, to prevent individual rights violations. And they also have a role of guiding the uh, national administrative uh, framework and uh, practices uh, so that they would be up to required standards. Uh, so th this is why I, uh, I uh, focused on, I want to focus on this, um, on this issue in this presentation. And in terms of methodology, uh, well, it, this is an empirical study uh, of the case law where I've uh, collected over 200 uh, court decisions from like 20 different courts in Turkey. And it was difficult because there are no central databases available. So I had to like one by one obtain the court decisions from lawyers, from NGOs and so on. So act people active in the field. Uh, so it was a challenge in that sense. But I believe I've managed to gather a sufficiently wide and qualitatively representative sample because um, the persons I talked that are active in the ground, uh, the, the lawyers or the NGOs, they, the, the uh, issues, the legal issues that they uh, identify, uh, they overlap with the legal issues uh, that I was able to detect in the court decisions. So I thought, okay, so there's a, a, a certain overlap between uh, these two, so uh, I should be on the right track. And I should also mention that this is part of a larger study uh, for my PhD thesis, which I submitted just a couple of uh, weeks ago, a uh, huge burden off. Um, and uh, I mean, those uh, doing or already done PhD would uh, understand, I think. Um, so in that uh, study, I, uh, not, I do not only focus on asylum, but also on removal and administrative detention. And I carry out a similar uh, analysis of case law. So, but uh, what um, we will focus on today is the uh, uh, case law on asylum. And the first uh, problematic issue is the risk arising from uh, non-state actors. Uh, so what, what's the problem here? Um, Turkish judges tend to focus on risk of persecution only by state actors, and they dis disregard the cases of persecution by non-state actors. Um, so it, the required standard actually entails that uh, other than state actors, single persons, clans, tribes, guerrillas, and so on, uh, all those uh, types of actors listed here in the slide um, should be also, could be also act, uh, actors of persecution in the sense of uh, asylum uh, protection. And um, in the case that, of course, if the state of origin is unwilling or unable to offer protection, but um, when it comes to uh, private uh, persons, um, persecution by private persons, we see that Turkish courts do not look at uh, whether this, the state of origin is unwilling or unable to offer protection. Um, so these are, uh, for instance, three example cases. Uh, generally, uh, I mean, I, due to time restrictions, I will not... Um, tell you about each case, but generally it's, uh, I can say that it's per persecution uh, from uh, the uh, individuals like uh, wife's ex-husband or from families, uh, from their ex-husbands and so on, uh, because of their lifestyle or because of their uh, new marriage. Um, so uh, the in all these cases, uh, the applicants uh, claim uh, that there will be an ill treatment or, or there have been ill treatment from such actors. And um, uh, without uh, any uh, uh, difference, uh, the uh, court decisions, the, the courts uh, say that the 
um, the applicants are not member of any political, religious, and social group. They do not face any ill treatment from uh, official authorities. Uh, so there is no uh, risk of uh, persecution. There is no uh, need for international protection for the applicants. So they provide a generic reasoning. They do not uh, look at the country of origin, uh, inform country of origin information, and uh, they fo focus solely on lack of risk of persecution by state actors. Um, another so and also which means uh, I mean this this means uh, it leaves a great deal of uh, uh, persons uh, who are in need of international protection. Uh, to be left outside uh, of such uh, protection. Um, and second issue is the is about implicit withdrawal. Um, what I mean by implicit withdrawal is uh, when a person submits an asylum application, if he or she does not uh, follow up the uh, administrative procedures required by that uh, application, like attending the interviews or submitting some information and so on. Um, or if they are not found in the address, they are not uh, residing uh, in the address that they are assigned to, uh, that, that they should be residing uh, during this asylum procedure. Um, then uh, the uh, administration takes it to mean that uh, this person, in fact, wants to withdraw its application, his or her application. So it, that's why it's called implicit withdrawal. And um, uh, in Turkey, also, uh, this is implemented uh, that if the person does not follow up the asylum procedure, uh, then it is deemed that there is an implicit withdrawal. It is. It does make sense in the uh, because in in to to a certain extent because uh, if the person does not have the intention to uh, follow up its his or her asylum application, he should not be uh, blocking the system. Also, uh, so the purpose of this uh, rule is um, uh, this. But in uh, some implementations, we see that uh, it is actually a bit. Um, uh, not serving this uh, pur purpose, let me say, um, because uh, in some with implicit withdrawal uh, reasons, um, the law also specifies that the person might have a justified excuse. So maybe a person has missed her interview, or maybe a person was not found in uh, her residence, but um, if there's a justified excuse for this, uh, then uh, implicit withdrawal should not be implemented. Uh, but uh, the problem, the judicial problem arises from the, the uh, interpretation of what constitutes justified excuse. Um, well, in uh, Turkey also, I should mention that uh, there is a system of dispersed uh, residents. Uh, the asylum applicants are assigned to certain satellite cities. And this, uh, may, the city that they are assigned to may not match all the time their preferences or their personal circumstances, employment chances, and so on. And changing cities is pretty difficult in practice. Uh, so um, people find themselves many times in uh, situations where they have to leave uh, a certain city or they have to, uh, they cannot follow up their uh, asylum application, but this is. Uh, actually um, caused by the system itself and not because of the uh, lack of intention or, of pursuing the asylum application. Um, this is expressed by UNHCR as well uh, by saying that this implicit withdrawal should not be implemented uh, so that it would uh, cause termination of applications uh, by applicants who don't have the intention to withdraw their application, who don't have the intention to drop out of the system. Um, and uh, just because they uh, fail to comply with procedural rules, they should not be left out of the system. Um, and well, there are many, many examples of this in Turkish uh, courts. So I will not again uh, go into uh, uh, talking about all the 
cases because I'm already almost out of time, I guess. Um, but I let it just suffice to, uh, for me to say that um, uh, in even in claims concerning health uh, problems uh, and concerning uh, uh, inability uh, to uh, follow up the administration due to like religious reasons, health reasons, or uh, uh, employment uh, conditions, employment reasons, um, they have been disregarded frequently uh, by uh, Turkish courts. Um, so they thought they completely, in these cases, they completely disregarded claims and uh, they just didn't assess the excuse claims. Uh, but also there is another type of discrepancy where they uh, uh, the courts follow a restrictive approach. So they to take into account the excuse, but they do not find it sufficient, uh, let me say. And this, uh, the first category of this is uh, about the vulnerabilities, about vulnerabilities and protection needs of disadvantaged uh, refugee groups, such as single women and LGBTI individuals. Uh, so these are the example cases here, uh, but we see that uh, here, even though the um, the court uh, mentions that there is such an excuse uh, uh, claim by the applicant, uh, that this is not sufficient and the implicit withdrawal uh, should uh, prevail. Again, this is uh, the same um, also for the systematic challenges uh, about labor markets, uh, many times the uh, uh, the asylum seekers are not able to find job opportunities in cities that they are assigned to, and they have to go to bigger cities, metropolitan cities, which are not satellite cities, by the way. So uh, they go to Istanbul or uh, other um, uh, close by big cities uh, where they cannot reside uh, as asylum seekers but they have to uh, do so actually in order to sustain themselves because they do not receive any substantial um, governmental uh, monetary support. Uh, so they have to uh, take care of, uh, of uh, themselves. Um, so uh, uh, this was the issue uh, about the is, uh, about implicit withdrawal and uh, I will just, I have, uh, I will, uh, briefly talk about the final issue and uh, then finish uh, wrap up my presentation. Um, the uh, final issue is um, in um, court decisions about asylum uh, decisions, asylum applications. Um, in negative, when the administration administration gives negative uh, asylum uh, decisions, then the applicant appeals this. And during this appeal, uh, the court does not only look at whether uh, the conditions of asylum are there or not, or whether the decision on asylum by the administration is lawful or not, uh, but they go one step further and they assess the removal uh, possibility of the, of the uh, applicant. Well, this is uh, um, uh, problematic because um, a uh, removal uh, order is another administrative uh, decision. So uh, first the uh, negative decision on asylum is given and then uh, when this becomes final, the removal decision is given and there uh, the narrow form uh, obligations are assessed, whether this person uh, will be uh, uh, safe if he or she is sent to, back to uh, uh, to the country uh, of origin. Uh, this is assessed in this uh, stage, but uh, even before this, um, the courts uh, uh, take upon themselves to assess this during asylum uh, appeals. Um, why is this a, a problem? Well, like I said, the subject matter of the lawsuit is not removal. This is another, this will be another uh, lawsuit. This will be a, a subject of another lawsuit. Uh, so the parties may be, uh, may have not um, submitted all relevant facts and claims. 
Um, so the court actually, when deciding this in asylum uh, appeal, uh, they uh, do it with lack of full knowledge of relevant facts. And uh, uh, this is a uh, problem. Uh, and uh, also the authority, um, there is a, there is a problem about authority because the court is then using an authority that should belong to administration. What I mean by this is uh, upon appeal of asylum, uh, the administration, uh, even the administration could not uh, make a removal decision yet. And uh, even before this, um, even before an administrative decision, the court is taking up, uh, taking it uh, up on itself uh, to comment on uh, removal, and hence uh, the court um, uses uh, the authority that doesn't belong to it at that moment. And uh, finally, the judgments are sort of an instruction to the administration to issue a removal order because the court, the judge says, uh, I do not uh, find it uh, legally problematic for this person to be removed. So administration, go ahead and uh, issue a removal order. Uh, in, in a way, the court is saying uh, uh, this, and this is very problematic because um, this is done without the full uh, assessment of the relevant uh, facts. Uh, so to conclude, I uh, I just want to go uh, uh, to summarize uh, the judicial discrepancies in Turkish case law we have went through today is uh, first uh, disregarding the risks arising from non-state actors, it, uh, the excuses um, about implicit withdrawal of uh, asylum applications, and also the premature assessment of removal during appeal of asylum uh, decisions. This um, should, uh, I mean, this assessment, this whole assessment should factor in the assessment of whether Turkey uh, should be deemed as a safe Turkey country, like I said in the beginning. And um, uh, these uh, problematic issues also uh, jeopardize the uh, refugee protection in uh, Turkey, unfortunately. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. And um, I'll be happy to discuss further in the end at the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Gamza. Uh, there were really striking issues. And I, and I do hope that we come back to those, some really important problems that you've raised. So the next presentation is uh, with me because it's a video. And it's from Sarah Trailer. Miss Sarah Trailer carries out interdisciplinary research on migration related topics with a focus on large scale political and legal tensions generated by the act of crossing the border into Europe. She is also an activist for freedom of movement, movement involved in transnational networks, conducting research, carrying out actions and supporting the struggle for a world without borders. Sarah graduated in 2020 from the multidisciplinary masters advanced migration studies, AMIS, at the University of Copenhagen with a thesis on strategic litigation at international quasi adjudicating bodies on violations occurring at the European borders from which this paper is extrapolated. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me. Greetings from sunny Sicily, where it is a mild 45 degrees outside. So let's start immediately because my presentation is a bit dense. Today, wait. Today, I'm going to talk about, let's see if this loads. Apologies for the animation, I couldn't take it off for this title. So today I'm going to talk about the role of strategic litigation in international quasi adjudicating bodies in addressing border violence in the Mediterranean. And yes, it is a mouthful. So I will talk about the challenge information of legality on a theoretical level through international strategic litigation. My name is Sarah Trailer, and I what I'm basing this uh, presentation on the research that I conducted uh, during my master's at the University of Copenhagen. 
Um, so um, let's start with a bit of context. So um, in this research, I focus on a very specific political and legal context, which is uh, the European southern border, uh, or better, the Central Mediterranean migration route. So the reach of European of Europe's migration regime has grown steadily over the last decades. In my research, I talk in my research I talk about the last twenty years. Um, these externalization policy these these policies are known as externalization policies by which the European Union and its states are delegating border control functions to third states all the way to the countries of origin, as well as to international institutions and private actors. So as European, as US border regime developed to its current state, a transnational civil society is also mobilized to generate resistance. This process has developed steadily for almost a decade and it has taken several forms, which include increasingly structured legal contestation. Um, the most well for known form of legal contestation is strategic litigation, which is the main focus of my research. Here I focus on international strategic litigation uh, in international courts and quasi adjudicating bodies to understand how these international courts have reacted to their increased responsibility in this context. So I will examine international courts and quasi adjudicating bodies, um, which I will in this research call, uh, all call international courts or ICs. Uh, I do this just for practical reasons, um, although they have quite uh, noticeable differences for the purpose of the research, they uh, behave in a very similar way. So more specifically, I look at the European Court for Human Rights, the International Criminal Court, the United Nations Treaty Bodies, uh, specifically the Human Rights Committee and the Committee Against Torture and the European Court of Auditors, cases that have been brought in these international courts. On the other side, I noticed a gap in the research in terms of the perspective of the litigators, litigators and legal practi practitioners that are involved in the preparation of these cases. And so I set out to start to fill this gap um, as they are an important actor in the social contestation that produces these, these cases. Uh, I spoke, focused specifically on the Global Legal Action Network, or GLAM, and the Italian Association for Juridical Studies on Migration. So the first section of my presentation will be dedicated to the first half of this research, um, which is the most detailed part. And the second will be dedicated to the beginning of uh, the research that should be conducted on litigators and legal practitioners. And then I will summarize, I will synthesize it all into my conclusion. So uh, my research methods are interdisciplinary. Um, it's constituted mostly of literature review and semi-structured interviews. Um, my methodology is practice theory. I use this as a theor theoretical framework uh, for my research. I find that it examines, uh, I find it to be uh, ideal because um, it can take into account both the political and the legal dimensions of this, um, of this phenomenon of uh, presenting courts cases to international courts. Sorry. And um, so I define practice theory as uh, I take Adler and Fulio more specifically definition of practice theory uh, as an approach that examines the constitutive practices behind the exchange between law and politics by foregrounding social practices and performances that reconstitute political and legal orders. So I look at the practice of legal uh, international strategic litigation. And here legality is a core concept. I define legality as the shared perception of legal conformity in this research. This is determined as Reykjavik and all others say by a combination of social recognition and juridical validation and manufactured through the interpretive struggles generated by this historical interplay. So legality is a core grounding concept and uh, it's an evolving conceptual nexus between law and politics uh, as we will see and I will expand on later in my research. So uh, here I've just listed a couple of important concepts in practice theory within this research the communities of practice uh, which are actors that engage in this contestation, the legal contestation that we will be looking at, um, and the habitus, the concept of the background knowledge that is necessary to enact the practice of legal contestation within these contexts, which is what um, the one of these uh, one of these strategies, one side of these strategies is looking to alter the habitus, the legal, the, the shared perception of legal conformity. I will expand on this later. So let's look at a moment for uh, at the idea of contestation as a 
trigger for legal change. So Bourdieu defines social change as occurring through hysteresis, which is a, a concept that is borrowed from um, physics. Um, hysteresis is denotes a time lag between the exposure of a ferromagnet to an external magnetic field and the ferromagnet's own magnetization. So uh, what I mean is the grad, what he means is that the gradual adaptation of the habitus to the changes in the char characteristics of the structure structures that determine it. So uh, as the structures change and how as legal perceptions change, the background knowledge on the basis of which actors and agents and communities of practice and enact legal practice changes. Kratochwil adds, adds, adds that change emerges when rules have to be applied to situations that are usually ambiguous. And this gives rise to grounds for contestation. Contestation is considered a trigger and fuel for normative change in my research. Uh, the fact that migration is covered by such a fragmented legal regime creates the conditions the perfect conditions for the emergence of ambiguity and there, the, therefore for contestation. An important thing to consider is uh, judicial lawmaking when we talk about international courts, which is the practice of international adjudication as creating the shift in actors' normative expecta expectations and as such developing legal normative normativity. We will look at this more in detail later. Okay, so let's look at IC's behavior. So these are the courts I will examine. Let's start from the European Court of Human Rights, which I would particularly focus on as it is perhaps the most important avenue of international strategic litigation on migration control in this region. This is historically, the European Court of Human Rights is historically perceived to take a progressive stance towards migration control. However, a second glance, uh, at a second glance, the court has historically alternated between progressive and deferential decisions. This, another way of saying this is that the court has engaged in dilemmatic adjudication, a concept that Baumgartel introduced in 2019, um, to my knowledge. And it's defined as rulings that reflect a sense of doubt, incoherence, and ambiguity, and that thereby open up the possibilities of rights, rights restricting interpretations and criticism of the legitimacy of courts. So here, I'm just giving you a very short summary of the timeline that I made about my selected case law on the topic. This case law has determined, uh, has either been directly addressing cases of uh, that emerge from violations on the central Mediterranean route um, or uh, cases in other contexts that have strongly influenced the legal and political landscape in this context. So as you can see, I, oh, oh I just broke uh, something, but I will fix it later. As you can see, the ones that I have, um, colored in green are the favorable decisions by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, cases that are considerable, considered favorable, uh, that ruling in favor of a functional um, for understanding of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is a central substantive argument in this context. Um, there's a strong uh, tension between uh, more territorial conceptions of jurisdiction. Uh, so the idea that states uh, exercise jurisdiction only on their uh, physical territory and a more functional uh, understanding of jurisdiction that is uh, that states can exercise jurisdiction when they exercise control or public powers or the normal powers that are uh, considered um, to be the prerogative of sovereign states over a certain space or a uh, group of people. So uh, in green are the more favorable decisions, in red are the more uh, are the more differential decisions. Um, and in yellow, I look at a very central case that I look at in my research. It's CHC Jama versus Italy and Xavara Edal versus Italy, Albania. Um, these cases I can expand on later. If you're curious, I can also send you um, a description of what happened. Uh, but these are both, uh, hap these both happened in the Mediterranean. Uh, Xavara happened between um, Italy and Albania. Uh, here, the court ruled the case inadmissible on other grounds, but established Italy's jurisdiction over the events, even though uh, these events unfolded off of Italian territory. This set an important precedent for Hirsi versus Italy, a case that unfolded in the central Mediterranean, by which Italy was seen um, to be un 
uh, exercising the Jura and de facto control over the migrants that were intercepted by an Italian boat. Um, de facto, the Jura because the boat was flying an Italian flag and de facto because they were exercising control over uh, the people's lives in returning them to Libya or, um, or anything else that they might have chosen otherwise. And finally, farther down, we see um, a very strong differential turn that the European Court of Human Rights has taken in the last years, uh, last year, basically. Uh, these have been marked particularly by these two decisions, ND and DNT versus Spain, uh, which makes um, collective expulsion a bit more easy, quite a bit more easy for European states, um, collective expulsion at the border. Um, this was, uh, this happened between uh, an enclave Ceuta and Mar Morocco. Uh, the court argued that the Africans did not exhaust means of legal entry and that their behavior, uh, their expulsion is the result of culpable conduct for the attempt of entering in group and uh, in a um, disorderly fashion. Uh, at the same time, and then in others versus Be Belgium reverts to um, a notion of territorial jurisdiction that was introduced in 2001 by Bankovic and all. Um, so a return to uh, the far past uh, and a very uh, infamous uh, decision uh, on, from the perspective of uh, litigators. Uh, now there's a current case that is pending uh, that unfolded in the Mediterranean uh, that argues that Italy had de facto control over a rescue operation that went bad uh, that resulted in the confrontation between um, NGO ship at Sea Watch 3 and the Lib so-called Libyan Coast Guard. Um, here there's also again uh, a, a strong argument for functional jurisdiction. Um, the challenge here is to prove Italy's jurisdiction over the event even though the ship conducting the pullback was not under the Italian flag in this case, like it had been for heresy, but it would require a broader understanding of the way jurisdiction can be applied extraterritorially. So we can see in European Court of Human Rights, this oscillation, uh, we will return to this uh, later in the analysis. Then I will look at the International Criminal Court. Uh, here I focus basically, basically on two complaints, the Mediterranean complaint, which is a 244 page communique submitted by Schatz and Baracco uh, in uh, June, 2019. This, is, this communique asked for the opening of an investigation on European agents for crimes against humanity. The ICC declined to open investigations here and did not publish any response. And then the second one is on the situation of in Nauru and Marus, Manus Island, which was prepared by Clan and is considered by themselves as the most comprehensive submissions on submission on crimes against humanity perpetrated outside the context of war. ICC declined to open investigation in a four page response here as well. So let's make, uh, considering that the ICC has declined to open any sort of investigation over issues um, of, that regard um, extraterritorial um, externalization of border control, let's say, um, the ICC at the same time opens the grounds for interesting political considerations. So no one was really among the experts surprised at the ICC's unresponsiveness. And let's look at a moment at why. So on one side, the ICC has difficulty in establishing authority. It has been object to quite a bit of criticism. Uh, it's a work is perceived as biased, fo focusing almost exclusively on leaders from African states. Um, yes. Um, and a number of countries have tried to withdraw from their own statute or strongly contested the court. There's also been uh, more recently quite an extreme reaction from Western powers from which, for which investigations were opened. And I'm thinking about the USA and um, the threatening of uh, court officials on the part of the administration. So what would be the implications of opening an investigation on the Mediterranean communique, for example, let's look at this. Um, investigating high EU officials and central political leaders such as Merkel and Macron. This is, this would be quite an intense and important political step. Mm, but let's also consider that the EU International Criminal Court strongly relies on the EU for political support and um, Europe has been the strongest bedrock of support for the International Criminal Court, and the court relies heavily on the EU's support to function. Indeed, and I argue also uh, funding is important, 
European countries taken together provide more than half of the ICC's funding. Uh, and without the EU support, the ICC would not be able to function. International institutions can base their behavior on the political inclination of their stronger, strongest supportant, supporters. And I find that the element of funding is an important revealer of power relationships, which in this case, strong states over, have over international institutions. So um, just a, a little moment of reflection that critical assessments of power structures in place need to maintain a prominent position in the discussion if we are to face to make a comprehensive political analysis of this institution. However, it is not the case that we should completely dismiss uh, the value of uh, and potential of the use of international criminal law and of appealing to the ICC for these cases. I uh, pick up um, Calpuso's argument um, that international criminal law has a strong expressivist potential. So uh, uh, this, this reason goes along the lines of criminal law has been recognized to reproduce and reinforce existing power structures and migration is regularly associated with crimes. So international criminal law offers the possibility of reversing this relationship and use the same rhetorical tools against those responsible for the violations occurring at the, to the damage of migrants by presenting an authoritative reinterpretation of who is perpetrator and who is victim. So yes. And then I also add through the, an interview that I had with uh, Itamar Mann, which is also who is a researcher, academic and legal practitioner who's active in the preparation of these cases, is that ICAL uh, might have the potential for activating a transnational learning process. And I can come back to this if you're curious about this. Um, so now I'm going to be looking at soft courts. Uh, let's start from the UN treaty bodies. Um, just to give a little description of their potential, uh, although they have no express binding force and they can only issue recommendation, um, from 1998, 1990 to 2019, uh, there has been a staggering 92% compliance rate with non refoulement decisions. And non refoulement decisions um, have constituted around 80% of the Committee Against Torture's caseload. This is both regarding the Committee Against Torture. Another important thing to consider about UN treaty bodies is that they can issue general comments. So they do not have to wait for a case to be brought to, to issue a statement. So here I list a couple of general comments that are uh, particularly uh, important for the Committee Against tor uh, Torture. General comment number two that later became number four. Um, so jurisdiction is activated in there, any territory in which a state exercises de uh, jure de facto effective control, which means a functional reading of jurisdiction. And then I briefly examine the case of JHA versus Spain. And then I look at the Human Rights Committee, uh, specifically uh, what is good to note about the Human Rights Committee is they've also made quite a, an expensive uh, reading of um, jurisdiction, extraterritorial jurisdiction in their general comment number 36. They also have quite a bit of cases pending. Uh, a lot of international uh, strategic, strategic litigators have uh, placed a lot in, uh, into this court. SDG versus Italy was a case lodged in 2019 by Glenn. SG and the Cairo Institute of Human Rights Studies have also lodged another complaint in 2020. And more recently in January 2021, uh, the Human Rights Committee issued um, a positive statement on um, extraterritorial ju jurisdiction, uh, confirming their uh, functional approach to the establishment of jurisdiction in the case of the famous 11 of October shipwreck in 2013 that caused the death of 200 people, including 60 children. And finally, I'd like to touch upon the European Court of Auditors. Uh, there was a complaint handed in in April 2020. This is the first submission made in this context. The first known use of the European Court of Auditor in uh, international strategic litigation on my part. Um, and uh, the submission requests the European Court of Auditor to launch an audit into the EU's cooperation with Libya and specifically the EU Trust Fund for Africa. So the EU Commission is accused of breaching EU budget law for permitting divergence of European development funds to non-development objectives such as border control through the Integrated Border Management Program for the amount of 19 million euros. So what are the advantages and briefly of submitting to the European Court of Auditors? 
The first is that you're directly involving EU institutions, whereas normally international courts can generally address one, one state at the time. And second, following financial flows constitutes the methods for engaging with more far removed actors. It's EU institutions that have been using border states as proxies for the operationalization of their externalization policies. So let's take a moment to conduct a, conduct a brief analysis of all this data. Um, the potential and risks of fragmentation and legal interpretation when you're conducting international strategic litigation in multiple courts. So what can this create? The growing body of case law in multiple courts over time can, on the one side, contribute to the enhancement of the norms, coverage, and efficiency. On the other, lead to the fragmentation, to fragmentation such as it ceased to guide state conduct. So issuing enough statements that are contradictory can, be, uh, can create uh, an environment by which states can just decide to pick any norm that they would like to defend themselves with. And it would make court's decisions become um, irrelevant in the context. How, and in the end, another possibility is to have ambivalent and mixed outcomes, which I like to think is still the case here. So um, there are some proposals for the future to avoid the fragmentation, the level of fragmentation that would make these court decisions irrelevant, which would be to pass from dilemmatic adjudication and norm shopping uh, to strategic adjudication and constructive human rights pluralism. Um, I can also expand on this uh, in the questions if anybody would like to. So distributing litigations across different international courts and legal regimes can help ease pressure on individual in institutions and make it harder for states to anticipate and adjust their policies to new case law. This is an argument made by Tan, Tan and Gamaltoff Hansen uh, on the advantages of expanding creatively the um, areas, um, spaces of legal contestation and including as many institutions as possible in this debate. So, <clears throat> Let's look at a moment, let's make a, one last reflection on an international court's behavior. Um, I see need to preserve their authority to function. Um, legal scholarship, legal counsel, other courts, at the same court at a later point in time must first be convinced of the quality of the decision. And in highly politicized contexts, this becomes difficult to navigate. So the challenge is how to keep act challengers engaged while ensuring states respect of the decision. So when we assess the impact of a case, the impact can be ambiguous. Uh, cases need to be constantly and comprehensively assessed. And uh, for the future, we can think about new ways of uh, conceptualizing responsibility. I can expand on this as well. Here, international ex uh, strategic litigation litigators, I will look in the second section um, at GLAN and ASGI. Um, so one, some things that emerge from my uh, research on these two um, actors, organizational platforms, um, is a process of creative diver diversification of international courts chosen to present a case. So forum shopping, engaging with different international courts simultaneously in ways that fill the gaps and limitation of the individual international court, harmonizing, harmonizing domestic and international strategic litigation between different international courts and international courts and domestic courts, and testing in innovative methods such as engaging networks that are active in different fields of practice, something that has always been the case in international strategic litigation, but is particularly um, evident here, and exploring enforcement mechanisms such as the European Court of Human Rights Committee of Ministers. So uh, we have looked at how international uh, strategic litigation has functioned in terms of the production of case law. I'd like to touch upon a moment uh, the importance of semantic authority and the importance of the use of international strategic litigation for advocacy purposes. So framing a political issue through a favor legal interpretation can be a powerful rhetorical tool both in court and beyond. A more long-term objective of international strategic litigators is to build up semantic authority. So the ability to uphold, question, and destroy knowledge structures, or the capacity to influence and shape meanings as well as the ability to establish its communications as authoritative reference points in legal discourse. So how is this done? On one side, it's done by communicating an argument through an established standards of legal reasoning. On the other, by submitting cases that tease out the political and discursive struggles taking place. So for example, the expressivist use of international criminal law, 
And finally, in hybridizing the practice of litigation and making use of a, a dynamic civil society um, and set of communities of practice through organizational platforms. So in conclusion, um, let's look at uh, the international strategic, strategic litigation and the shaping of legality. Uh, these analysis show that contestation waged at international courts have the potential to shape legality in different ways. On one side, through the production of case law, so the establishment of one legal interpretation over another in a de specific decision, and also through the accumulation of the necessary and semantic authority from one actor's interpretation to gain standing over another's. So from a civil society perspective, international strategic litigation could shape legality um, because ICs on one side provide a forum for civil society's legal interpretation to solidify, solidify into case law, which impacts state behavior, and this is a given, uh, which I consider a given, most almost considered the rest. Um, through the performance of legal contestation at the basis of the Greek constitution of legal meaning, uh, and even if it's unsuccessful, presenting a case to international courts allows civil society to bring their own legal interpretation for authoritative appraisal. This can, in the long term, produce a shift in the understanding of what is illegal or legal and imbue litigators with semantic authority, uh, result in, resulting in the long term and the possible recognition of one legal interpretation over another on the part of the courts. Here, I'll just give you a little image of um, a, um, of a, um, a graph that I made, sorry. Um, here I put all the um, actors, agents, communities of practice in a space uh, to place them in relation to one another. And through time, I put a timeline on the side. Uh, this would need a bit more explanation, but basically on the middle I trace um, the cases uh, that were adjudicated by the European Court of Human Rights to just to show the oscillation in the international courts um, uh, sentences, decisions. Um, and on the right, I look at how challengers have evolved through time. Um, and on the left, I look at how states have evolved through time uh, and how these things have influenced and have been influenced by the court decisions. Um, thank you very much for listening. I re remain available for questions and this is my contact. If you'd like to engage in a more in-depth conversation about this, I would be very happy to. Um, and thank you for listening and sorry if I went a bit beyond the admitted time, but and sorry if it was so dense, but I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Okay, thank you very much to Sarah for that uh, presentation. As I say, uh, do hold on to your questions. We'll, give, we'll uh, have questions and answers towards the end. I want to now move on to uh, uh, Shula and I'll give you a bit of information about her paper. So Dr. Shula Tomkinson is an associate professor at the political science department of Laval University. She studies justice outside of courts. More specifically, she examines how democratic states deliver administrative justice, how they measure its quality, and how they innovate in this area with the contribution of non-state actors. Sheila, we're delighted that you're here with us today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. Hello, everyone. I hope you are doing well. I'm not going to use a PowerPoint presentation. I'll just present it like that. So the title of my paper has changed. It is much more precise now, even though it's a bit long. It is restricting access to refugee status through internal flight alternative and the use of jurisprudential guides and the danger of shallow decision making. So what I'll present to you today is extremely preliminary and it builds on my previous research, which focused on fact finding and construction of credibility in refugee hearings in Canada. And what I do in this paper is through a case study that looks at official documents and refugee decisions in Canada of asylum applicants from Nigeria, I will argue that internal flight alternative is an instrument in the toolbox of destination countries in the global north to limit access to refugee status. And I'll say it's a legally authorized, politically supported administrative measure. 
I'll also talk about a recent preoccupation with the speeding up of asylum decision making, what Jessica Humbley and Nick Jill called legal quickening. I will argue that its use can unwittingly invite rampant use of stereotypes, hinder deliberation and analysis, and ultimately result in what Richard Lampert and Joseph Sanders have called shallow decision making. But first, a bit of a background on the main issue. Internal protection, relocation, or flight alternative, what I will consistently call as internal flight alternative, is, a widely, is widely regarded as a well-established element of refugee protection regimes today. It is a limit on refugee status that potentially applies when a claimant's risk of persecution is confined to a specific part of the country of origin. It permits the refugee receiving state or asylum applicant receiving state to refuse refugee status to a person who faces persecution or similar harms in the area of previous residence, but can presumably live safely and reasonably well somewhere else in their country of origin. And it is important to mention refugee convention does not Ex refer expressly to it. Huh? For many refugee law scholars like James Hathaway, Michelle Foster, or Jessica Schultz, IFA is invoked by destination states in the global north to deny refugee status to persons at risk of being persecuted. And another observation that I'd like to make is States seem to raise or invoke IFA when they receive increasing numbers of refugee claims from major source countries that raise similar issues. States in Northern Europe, Germany and the Netherlands began invoking IFA as a limit on refugee status from the mid 90s onwards, initially on claims involving minority groups, ethnic and religious minority groups from Turkey. And today, IFA is a common feature of refugee status determination regimes in many destination countries. And we can find IFA principle in the 1979 UNHCR handbook. So what does this tell us, right? How does Canada apply IFA? So. To summarize again, right, IFA is a concept that tells us a person can be a refugee in one part of their country, but not elsewhere. And it is the asylum authority that raises the possibility of an IFA during refugee hearings or asylum procedures. And the burden is on the refugee claimant to establish on the balance of probabilities that there is a serious risk of persecution in the proposed IFA, or that the conditions are such that it would be objectively unreasonable in the circumstances, right? And Canada is raising IFA since the early 1990s. So my first observation is within this context, in order to render the use of IFA more effective, Canada's Immigration and Refugee Board, which is an independent quasi-judicial administrative tribunal that functions at arm's length from the government resorts to jurisprudential guides. So what are jurisprudential guides? According to the Immigration and Refugee Board, Board's website, these guides are decisions identified by the chairperson that are particularly well-written, detailed, and contain persuasive reasoning. And the identification of jurisprudential guides facilitates fair decision, fair decision making consistent with the tribunal's statute. And as well as its obligation to deal with all proceedings in front of it in, in as informally and as quickly as possible uh, within the limit of the principles of fairness and natural justice. It draws on common law tradition of precedent and the, as well as the, the tribunal tradition to adopt its policies. 
And the idea is that the use of jurisprudential guides will lead to cohesive and coherent decision making. So therefore, these are legal proced precedents uh, in considering all future similar cases. And one observation that is important to plug here is that jurisprudential guides always relate to top origin countries or major source countries. And the most recent ones were decisions involving claimants from China, India, Pakistan, and Nigeria, the top uh, asylum, uh, asylum proceeding producing countries for Canada, asylum seeker proceeding countries. Um, obviously, it's hard to determine without examining all relevant decisions how effective jurisprudential guides are in increasing consistency. But I'd like to talk to you about a jurisprudential guide identified in May 2018 and was revoked in April 2020 regarding Nigeria. You might have heard, starting in 2017, thousands of Nigerian nationals came to Canada through Canada-US border to claim asylum in Canada. There was a lot of debate in the public opinion as well as media whether these uh, claimants actually were genuine refugees or not. But many were raising the fact that they were coming to US. They could have applied for asylum within the US instead of coming to Canada. And many of these claimants have raised the fear or the danger of female genital mutilation by non-state actors, such as relatives, extended family, or village leaders. And the decision that has been identified as a jurisprudential guide, found that based on the documentary evidence available at the time, there were several large cities in Nigeria that could, depending on the facts of the case, could serve as viable flight alternatives for persons fleeing non-state actors. Like to, to give you an idea of the percentage of claims, uh, Nigerian claims among the case load of the tribunal, uh, in 2017, about 12% of refugee claimants were from Nigeria. In 2018, this rose to 20%. And in after the adoption uh, of after the identification of the, the jurisprudential guide, it dropped to 7.7% claims, percent claims in 2019. And they are dropping right now more and more. And what I also found was most appeals and judicial review applications regarding IFA were filed by claimants from Nigeria during the last few years. So the next step of the project will be to look at some of these decisions in more detail and to see how refugee, refugee appeal division, which is, which is a section within the tribunal that reviews independently mostly on paper, the decisions of first instance uh, decision makers, and to identify how they adopt this jurisprudential guide and what kind of arguments they present against its adoption. And now the second part, the second argument that I would like to make. The use of jurisprudential guides regarding IFA, and especially when the number of claims increase, can have adverse effects on the quality of decisions. So with the significant increase in the number of pending asylum applications in front of the Canadian Refugee Tribunal since 2017, uh, to give you an indication, the backlog was to about uh, 17,000 in 2016, and it rose up to 90,000 cases in 2020. So quite a significant change. To respond to that, uh, the tribunal management has begun to set as well as increase annual case processing targets for, for instance, decision makers uh, in order to 
as well as inciting them to deliver oral decisions from the bench. And this preoccupation with the speeding up of asylum decision making or legal quickening, right, can potentially pose inherent danger to the dispensation of justice to asylum applicants. It can unwittingly invite rampant use of stereotypes, hinder deliberation, and ultimately result in what Lampert and Sanders have called shallow decision making. For example, through a look of through a look at official tribunal documentation regarding performance expectations from individual first instance decision makers, I found that before 2017, there was no clear quantitative case targets for refugee decision makers. But this has changed starting in 2017 and kept increasing with the number, with the increase in the backlog. And to give you an indication, uh, in, in 2017, for example, the annual case targets were 80 to 90 for decision makers, and this went up to 150 in 2019. And why is this important? Why could this be relevant? Because according to public administration research, the use of stereotypes are especially prevalent under time constraints and high workloads. When individuals' ability to process information systematically is weakened, there is a danger that they increasingly rely on stereotypes as a way of simplifying the task that is at hand, right? And these stereotypes can be considered as judgmental heuristics, which are psychological shortcuts uh, that abstract and simplify complex decision on the basis of rule of thumb, to quote from Hapley and Jill's paper. So therefore, when decision makers are become increasingly concerned with time pressures, and lack the time to deliberate the cases they hear, they process information in a more heuristic fashion. Under these condition, conditions, there is a danger that decisions are made without proper consideration of all relevant elements of the case. And the speeding of the speeding of processing of asylum cases could lead decision makers to simplify and accelerate their work in order to avoid wasting time. And it could also prompt them to focus on the stereotypical elements of the case, which would result in shallow decision making. And I did find some examples of this shallow decision making, where the decision makers were kind of admonished or reprimanded at the judicial level by judicial review by federal court or at the appeal level that the, 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 the decision maker was not providing arguments at all. So obviously the tension between disposing of cases efficiently and fairly is neither a novel concern, nor is it unique to asylum decision-making. I do not see speedy or efficient decision-making in contradiction with the fairness of the process and the quality of decisions either. But however, when efficiency becomes the main priority that is privileged, there is a danger that other relevant values take the backstage. So to conclude, the IFA is an instrument in the toolbox of destination countries in the global north used to limit access to refugee status. It is a legally authorized, politically supported administrative measure. As the federal court judge Justice Shore explained recently in a judicial review decision, which I will drop at the chat if you like the citation. The concept of IFA is inherent to the concept of refugee. For asylum authorities in the global north, it is determinative and sufficient as a basis on which to reject the applicant's refugee claim. In my presentation, I observed that in Canada, through the identification of jurisprudential guides or legal precedents, IFA is legitimized for rejecting claims from major source countries. 
I also raised the possibility that beyond offering a legitimate basis for limiting access to asylum, the use of ISA, IFA to jurisprudential guides in a context of rising claims and pressures to make decisions in a more efficient manner can result in shallow decision making. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Shulet. Thank you to all our speakers for bringing your expertise and giving us your time. I know it's not uh, an easy time, Shulet especially, I know it's very early in the morning for you. So thank you very much for giving us your time today. Uh, a, great, a great discussion. And I hope we can stay in touch and have more conversations like this in the future.